Hi, I'm Sabin Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Some Observation on Power Supply for High Side Gate Driver. This is a presentation I gave at the Infineon Nisco Power Days on the 20th of June 2023. I'd like to thank Evgeny Semidotsky for his assistance in the preparation of this presentation. The subject matter of this presentation is actually related to the present interest of wide band gap devices like gallium nitrate, silicon carbide, and for them we know we need uh, to be very careful about the gate drive. I'm showing here half a bridge and here's the high side driver. We have to be very careful, this driver has to have very good, first of all, isolation, secondly, uh, immunity to the VDT, and then some other features uh, which are really associated with the characteristics of, uh, say, silicon carbide and gallium nitride transistors. It's not always recognized that similar restriction and requirements are required of the power supply that supplies this high side driver. And here also we need, of course, uh, insulation because this could be high voltage, 800 volt or maybe higher than that. And then uh, we have uh, the question of the VDT and some other issues. So this presentation is concentrates on this power supply, this isolated power supply. Now, obviously you can buy it. They are not cheap. They are fairly expensive, but the good ones, of course. But the point is that sometimes you'd like to make your own, especially in cases that you need many in a system. And as it turns out, if you build your own, you can have one unit with a number of isolated outputs. So this presentation is really talking about this isolated power supply. Now, what are the requirements of this power supply? First of all, of course, I isolation, insulation between um, <coughs> input and output, breakdown, high breakdown voltage, and also immunity to the VDT, which is also related to this issue of small input to output capacitance. I'll talk about it in a minute. And then this particular unit, really power supply, does not require very high output power because all the current that we are going to have is the gate charge uh, times frequency. And so it's for one transistor, it will be a few milliamp. Uh, if it's more than one transistor, then of course it will be higher than that. We'd like to have good efficiency, and especially not because of uh, power saving, but uh, we don't want a unit which should be very hot. And then, generally, we don't need a tight voltage regulation, although in some cases, uh, some uh, devices do have a very narrow uh, band of gate voltage that you have to watch and not to uh, go over it. In this case, you have to watch it to see if this is good enough. I am talking about cases that you really don't need that tight uh, voltage regulation for the gate driver. So I'm talking particularly about this configuration, this topology, which is the simplest one, I think, for an isolated uh, DC to DC power supply. This is like a DC to DC transformer, or you might say it's a transparent converter. We have a driver we may or may not have a DC coupling capacitor, a transformer, a rectifier, and capacitor. Now what we don't have is regulation, we don't have feedback, and also we don't have an inductor at the output. This is just uh, a capacitor filter just at the output of the rectifier. So we're going to have a square wave, and then we're going to have a square wave here, which is rectified, and here we have this DC voltage. So this is the idea of this very, very simple transformer. However, there are some issues and w many things you have to watch and worry about and make sure that they're probably attended to and the, the design really is clear of problems. And this is what I'm going to do by going uh, throughout the design. Let me start off with the question of the interwinding capacitance or input-to-output capacitance that you need here. Again, as I've said, we'd like to have it as small as possible. The reason is, very similar to what you have in a driver, is that in a typical application, 
suppose this is the higher uh, transistor, you have a swing here of high voltage, could be 800 or even more, and then you have a fast DVDT, especially if it's a silicon carbide or gallium nitride, be 400 volts, say. Then if the capacitance is, say, 10 picofarad, then according to this uh, equation, state equation, you're going to get with a 600 volt swing and 50 nanosecond rise time, you're going to have 1.2 M going through here. That's a lot. And this could really not only damage uh, the unit here, the controller, uh, it will mess up the control and the pulses, etc. So this is certainly something that you don't want. You like this capacitance to be as low as possible. And we are talking about the picofarad range. I'll show it later on. And this is what we need for this. So now I'm going to go stage by stage here uh, throughout this uh, topology and see what do we need for designing a proper unit uh, in each one of these uh, elements. So first of all is the driver. Of course, there are dedicated driver for this power supply. And uh, some companies are making them, you can buy them, or you can make your own. And this is something I'll show how uh, you design something very simple. Now the driver could be full bridge, like this. And then of course you get a square wave plus minus here, and which is then coming throughout. If it is 50%, you'll see it as in here. Or it could be half a bridge. In this case, of course, uh, the DC is blocked by the uh, capacitor and you get uh, plus minus half of VCC. And if uh, you need the uh, higher voltage uh, here, then you have to compensate it by say one to two transformer, depending of course on VCC and what is the gate voltage that you need. A simple way to build a driver is to use actually gate drivers, here it is, inverters, and build an oscillator around one of them, and then chain it to the second one, and here we got the drive, like a full bridge, plus minus, so you get the full swing of plus VCC, minus VCC, so this will be a very simple way to go. Now the oscillator can be simply built as an RC inverter oscillation. This is very well known from the CMOS uh, devices that uh, we've been using or use, still using. And the idea is that you use the unit with a threshold. It's a Schmidt trigger, so you have two levels here. So you charge the capacitor, it gets to this level, and then this kicks and goes down so it starts discharging the capacitor so by this you get an oscillator up and down very simply and here actually the V out you get the square wave now uh, to design it or to select the components here R1, R2, R3 you can just write the charging process okay the segment here this charging and this would be like a capacitor charging. Now the equivalent circuit here of course is uh, these two in uh, parallel and then you have an equivalent uh, voltage. And um, then the discharge is again into the two resistors in parallel and this is the discharge. So you have two equations, three unknowns. So you can select one which is very nice uh, for the scaling, one whatever capacitance you want and then you get these two resistors from solving this non-linear equation. You can do it by MATLAB and some other means. So this will be the oscillator and here I'm showing part of a demo board that uh, Infinon has uh, published distributing. Uh, this demo board for this particular case and uh, power supply, they are using two gate driver inverters so there are two gate drivers here inverters and here you see the uh, network here uh, for the oscillation and here comes out uh, from the two outputs of the two gate driver comes out the drive a word of caution here not all gate driver are the same there are some gate driver, and I'm showing here an example of Texas Instrument. Other companies are doing it also. 
which is like specified for 4.5 amp, but this is only for the during the switching period, the very beginning when you turn on or off the transistor. And here they have a sort of an added circuitry that boosts up the current for a short time. And then throughout the period, the current is lower. This is not good for this particular application. Here, we need the current throughout the period. So it's better to go to a driver, which is just specified with the RDS on of the output section, like uh, in this Infineon unit. And uh, of course, you have to worry about the power dissipation because uh, whatever the RDS on is, there is a current and so you have to make sure that uh, you operate in a safe region. I'm coming up now to the transformer. First of all, I'd like to mention that one of the desired feature of a transformer for this application would be low leakage. And the reason is that if the leakage is high, you have here an alternating current going back and forth here as the voltage is changing. And consequently, you have to charge and discharge this leakage inductance to get to the nominal current or the walking current. So therefore, you can lose voltage here. It will be a voltage drop as a function of the current. The higher the current, uh, the more time you spend charging these leakages, and consequently there will be a drop. So one requirement is a low leakage, and as I said before, uh, another one is very low capacitance. But as it turns out, this two requirements are actually in conflict because to get a good leakage or low leakage you have to separate the windings as far as you can get and maybe add some added insulation here because uh, there is a capacitance between the winding, the core, core and winding. So you like to separate it. Unfortunately, separating them makes the leakage inductor higher. Okay, so these are conflicts and there is a, you need to get a, to a compromise between the two. Obviously, if you are going to work at high frequency, you have more to worry about the um, leakage inductance because you cannot afford spending too much char time charging and discharging these inductances. So I'm showing here two commercial transformer for this purpose. One is uh, by uh, Pulse. This is, uh, you can get it with a multi-output, which is very nice. It is recommended for an analog device driver for this purpose. But see here, it's 400 micro Henry, which is very nice. And so it won't load the input. But the leakage is 0.5 micro Henry, which is very good. And uh, as I've said, uh, it's only like if you make a calculation here, it's only like 0.1% uh, leakage of the total inductance. They get it by interleaving. Okay, you can see that this thing is interleaved. Well, interleaving it increases the capacitance. And they don't give any information about the interwinding capacitance. On the other hand, there is another unit here that I'm showing uh, worth. Of course, many other companies are making these transformers, okay, by no means are these the only ones, but these are just examples for educational purposes. And I'm showing here a Word transformer, which has a 50 microhenry inductance, leakage 1.5, quite high, and uh, you can see that it's about, well, it's about 3% of the inductance, but it has very little coupling capacitor, okay? So here it is. Uh, it's probably built like that. These are separated, low in capacitance, but um, high leakage inductance. So if you go to very high frequencies, you better watch the leakage. If you work at moderate frequencies, maybe the leakage is not important, and if you can get much higher capacitance, okay? But a device like this with no data on the capacitance in the data sheet is just not acceptable, of course. 
Another point we have to take into account, aside from the capacitance and the leakage, we have to make sure that the transformer is not going into saturation. In this case, what you have to look at is the volt second okay, of this transformer, which indicates the verge of saturation. By the way, in the application note of Infineon uh, demo board, uh, they are printing here 6 volt per microsecond. This is, of course, incorrect. It's a carry-on from, uh, say, output uh, voltage of a transistor. Uh, here, we're talking about volt second, okay? So, in this case, this is 6 volt per microsecond, and uh, it's about 1 megahertz minimum to comply with this requirement if the excitation is the order of uh, 10 volt. And uh, in the case of the Infineon demo board they are running, it's about 2 megahertz, which is of course okay in this. So now I'm moving to the rectifier. There are a number of ways that you can uh, build a rectifier for this purpose we are talking about, this uh, power supply. It could be a half bridge, it could be a full bridge, and it could be also what we call a voltage doubler, because the voltage here is twice the input, since we are rectifying it one side, say the positive side here, the negative side here, so we get peak-to-peak -peak voltage uh, of the input if it's square wave, then it's uh, twice peak to peak. There are, however, a number of issues with these rectifier. I'm going to talk about these two, the full wave and the doubler. Uh, this is not very well recommended, and the reason is that if you have a half bridge here, there is a current flowing, then when the current is stopping, there is some reverse recovery, and then it stops, so you will expect here high oscillation. So this is something that we don't like. So therefore, I really don't uh, recommend this. So I'm going to talk about these two configurations. I'm going to repeat some of the information in a presentation on a video that I've already posted in my YouTube channel. And this is a pitfall of a transformer-based multi-output isolated DC to DC converter because it is relevant uh, to this uh, issue that we are discussing here. Now this work was done with uh, Oded and Evgeny uh, of uh, IRP system, they are working there. And what we are considering is a power supply, which is along the idea that I'm discussing here. Here we see a dedicated driver by analog devices. It has an oscillator driving it, although it has an internal oscillator, but if you like to change the frequency, you like to get another oscillator. And then we have here the transformer and then a a number of output windings, each one with a bridge, it's a full bridge rectifier, and here we have a filter. So I'm going now to run a simulation on this configuration. I'm showing only one output. I have here a transformer. This is a secondary bridge rectifier. These are filter capacitors, and here this represents the load for 33 million. I'm running it for well, it's sort of 50% because you see on is 5 microseconds and the period is 10 microseconds, so it's like 50%. But I've put here rise and fall time, 200 milliseconds, which is not negligible. So here it is. You see the rise time and fall time. This is 5 microseconds and the period is 10 microseconds. And lo and behold, if I look at the current, of the primary of the transformer, we see a lot of DC current. Okay, now why is this? Well, the reason is that the effective duty cycle is really not 50%. Because if you like look at the average here, you have to take into account the rise time. So it's a little bit more than five microseconds and consequently, there is a DC component and since the resistance of the wire is, is small, you generate a high DC current. So this is no-no. To remedy this, we need to put here a capacitor. And this capacitor now will block the DC. And we'll have only the AC, of course. And therefore, we're not going to have any DC current here, obviously. And here, if I run it again, it's uh, micro Henry. It's just a resolution of the simulation. Now, what about the secondary winding? What about the current in it? 
And here, surprise, surprise, although it's a full bridge, I do have some DC current. Now let me emphasize that we do not want DC current in the windings of this small transformer, which uh, in many cases uh, works on the verge of saturation or close to saturation. A DC current, since this is a transformer without a gap, a DC current will push it into saturation, so we really don't want any DC. And here I see in the secondary, uh, although it's a full bridge, I see DC. Now why is that? Well, because we don't really have a 50% duty cycle. So when it passes through a capacitor, these areas are the same because now it's AC, but these heights are not the same. So when it passes through the full bridge rectifier, only this half cycle is actually delivering power, okay? Well, this is not. So in this case, you have to watch it. And just to emphasize and to see it a little bit better, I'm running now with a duty cycle of 0.6. By the way, if you are building your own driver, the chances of uh, building it with exactly 0.5 mark, uh, duty cycle or under any condition is just zero. So you have to uh, prepare yourself to any duty cycle so it will work properly. So I've put here 0.6 duty cycle and what you see is that certainly there is DC and only one half of the bridge is working. The other one does, it does not work. This one really, except for transient, this half side does not work. So what we have here, again, is that due to the non-perfect uh, symmetry here, we have different heights. After the rectifier, you have them like this, and therefore only this side, uh, this half cycle, is actually providing current. So what to do? Well, Again, uh, a solution, a simple solution would, would be to put a capacitor here. And once you do that, of course, you get, uh, again, a very neat waveform with uh, just about zero. Uh, it should be zero. It's just an error of uh, the simulation. Zero current at the secondary winding. So what would I recommend is to put a capacitor here, capacitor here, especially if you are building your own uh, gate driver. Again, this is supposed to be 50%, but there is some tolerance to that, and even 1%, and even if it's 1% difference, and the resistance of the primary here is very low, you'll get DC current. So now I'm coming to the voltage doubler. And I've said we're getting here voltage, which is peak to peak actually of the voltage here. And there's one word of caution here in that if you are loading it this way with, uh, with two loads here, plus and the minus, these must be equal. Because if not, you're going to have a DC again in the second term. So make sure that you have a balanced load here in this particular configuration. Okay, now we have a DC voltage here. This will be uh, from side to side, but we do have to generate a bipolar drive in many cases, like silicon carbide would like to have it, and this is because uh, you have this uh, so-called Miller spike. Due to the injection of current from drain to gate during a fast slew rate here at the drain, and this will cause a spike here or might cause a spike here this is now the driver right and therefore you like the voltage when the transistor is off to be negative so when you have the spike it will not reach the threshold of the transistor a way to get this uh, bipolar drive is to use this configuration very simple we have a Zener diode and then a current limiting resistor. This will be the positive voltage. The remaining will be the negative one. And the idea is that you are setting here then a midpoint that you, you are actually connecting to the source. 
Now, again, you have to worry now about the symmetry of the two currents, charging and discharging. Now, during charging, you have a current like this, primarily coming from this capacitor. That's a certain charge. During discharging, you have this current here due to this charge. Now, these charges are equal because it's a capacitor that you charge and discharge and therefore it's an equal amount of charge times frequency. It's an equal average current. Luckily here, this current and this current are the same. So the average current here and the average current here of course, during half cycle, there is no DC through a ca uh, capacitor. But during the half cycle, the average current here and the average current here are the same. So there is no need for a current to pass through here. Uh, of course, these uh, charges are being eventually replenished by the source. Okay, but the point is that due to the symmetry and the fact that the two charges of charge and discharge are the same, all that is needed are these capacitor and there is no involvement of this Zener diode so therefore the current of the Zener diode could be fairly low obviously you have to choose here capacitors that will be able to provide the pulse especially at the very beginning of the turn on and turn off uh, that uh, could be like uh, amp or even more uh, for the small time of charging so that the voltage will not drop here so you have to choose the capacitor properly as usual. So here is the circuit diagram of the Infineon demo board for this power supply. This is the driver itself, okay, this is the gate driver, and this is the power supply. What we see here is the driver of this power supply which we have seen before, the two gate drivers in inverting uh, with the oscillator. We have a transformer, we have then the capacitor for the voltage doubler. This is no connection, well, not, not connection with 1%, okay? And uh, then we have uh, two capacitors and this Zener diode, actually it's not a Zener, it's a TL432, it's a stabilizer, which is operating as a Zener. This is the limiting uh, current resistor. So here are the two outputs and this is the midpoint. I see here that this uh, capacitor is 390 nanofarad, 4.7 microfarad. I think it would have been better to have balanced capacitor because otherwise uh, you'd expect a different ripple uh, here and here. Well, it may not be that bad, but why should you have it? And this will not affect uh, this uh, symmetry in terms of the charge, of course, but in terms of the ripple, there would be a difference here. Now, this demo board uses this transformer. Now, in the data sheet, you find that it has an 86 microhenry inductance of the primary and I guess secondary, but it's, I think it's a one to one. And then a leakage of 100 nanohenry. As you can see, we have here two windings which are separated far away. So, I would doubt, well, this is 0.1 microhenry. This is 86. So we are talking about an order of magnitude of 0.1% leakage. I would doubt if you can get it with this configuration. So I, I am not sure. Now, if it is much higher than that, there is a problem because this is run at 2 megahertz. And indeed, if you look at the measurement you see quite a bit of a drop as a function of the loading current okay so this i would question in the data sheet there is no information about the interwinding capacitance in the application note of this demo board infinon says that it is 1.3 picofarad well maybe it is that would be nice and it can be accomplished in this configuration but i would doubt if uh, this is really possible to get this 100 nanohenry. If so, it is quite an accomplishment. So there is another idea, which is very nice, actually mentioned in the uh, application note of this demo board, and that is to get rid of this uh, Zener diode and use the fact 
that you can generate with this voltage doubler two voltages which are asymmetrical, okay? And then this will be the midpoint. So you have one volt here, one voltage here, and one voltage here. You can do that because this voltage here, during the half cycle that this diode is conducting, this voltage here is the positive part, while here it's the negative part. And if you make them asymmetrical by having a non-symmetrical duty cycle, then of course you can get a plus which is different from the minus, so you have a bi-directional drive here without having uh, the uh, zener diode and resistor and associated circuitry. I think this is very neat, okay? Now, it's a little bit complicated to get all the values here because you start with an asymmetrical waveform in the sense that the duty cycle is asymmetrical, but the height of the driver, it's the same because you have plus VCC and minus VCC. But after you're passing through a capacitor, and this is what is fed to the transformer, you have AC, which means that the areas here are the same, so there is a shift of the DC. So now you get a higher voltage here and a lower voltage here, as you need, uh, but the relationship are a little bit intricate, it's written here. So this is, however, a very neat way uh, to go in this particular case. So this brings me to the end of this uh, presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it of interest and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.